Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. This week, I want to talk to you about what's next. Now what? What is the Holy Spirit up to in your life? And you may think about this in this way. Uh, you remember your BC days, before Christ days? <laughs> and then, now for me, it's a little tough because I was raised in the church, and so I was young when I came to the Lord. And so for me, it's more like things I've never done, you know, things I never got to, and that's the Holy Spirit keeping me from things. But I wasn't perfect, trust me. You just ask my parents. <clears throat> And teachers, yes, there's a couple of teachers in this place today, some of my teachers, my Sunday school teachers and, and whatnot. And, uh, but your BC days, you may have lived a certain way and you had you know, little conviction and remorse for things you did. And then when you get saved, all of a sudden you have conviction and remorse. Uh, so for some of you, you, your stories are amazing. I've heard some amazing stories here where your life changed drastically in, in a moment where you were, uh, you were addicted to something and that addiction was broke free immediately. You know, and for some of you, it may have been a progressive addiction breaking or a progressive growth. And that's normal too in the family of God. I've heard all the stories. And today I wanna to talk to you about the work of the Holy Spirit in sanctification. So salvation is the first part of our transformation. But at the same time at salvation, we are sanctified Immediately, we are what is called sanctification is made holy, but that is a process, and that's what we're going to get to today. I'm kind of giving you a sermon already, but I just want to uh, make sure you understand where I'm headed and the difference. And so, we're talking about the progression of your growth today, and we need the Holy Spirit to help us grow. We need the Holy Spirit to help us live. I've titled this message Power for Holy Living. We have power for holy living because the person of the Holy Spirit lives in us to give us that power. So I want to bring that out to you today. The scripture I'm going to begin with, I just want to give you real quick context before we read it. It's a strong scripture. It is a scripture that really shows you just an example of people being changed and transformed by salvation in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's one of many places, but this one in particular is the one that many authors, pastors, theologians use to show you what the Holy Spirit does. And I, I'm using it, but I just want you to know there's some strong language in it, and, but there's good news in it. And that's, it's important that we see and, and, and hear the scripture. Okay? First Corinthians, now that I got you all wondering. First Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to be 9 through 11, and then we're going to be getting into our, another major text, Romans 8. So if you want to put your finger in Romans 8 and, and hold it there, you can. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. I'm going to tell you guys a little uh, inside pastor secret. I uh, drink a lot of water up here because I take allergy pills, and they dry me out so much. So when I come up here and I have to talk quite a bit, I just get dried out. So if you see me drinking water, that's why. And my allergies have been bad recently. This is what Paul told the Corinthian church, and they were once really sinful, but then Jesus came and saved them uh, through the preaching of the gospel. And this is what it says, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Remember we talked about you have to be born again to inherit the kingdom of God last week? He says, do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That seems pretty, that's strong. And he's very bold that anyone who is in that sin and not forgiven of their sins and not transformed, if they have not been born again, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. That is, the, that is what is going to happen. But Paul says, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In other words, you were saved and sanctified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
There it is. That was you, but when Jesus came into your life and the Holy Spirit came into your life, you had power over that sin, you were saved from that sin, and now you no longer live like that, now you're living for God. And the reason why is salvation and the Holy Spirit has washed you. But here's the thing, the Holy Spirit stays with you so that you live a different life. We're not alone. The Holy Spirit has come to do a complete cleaning in your life. The word sanctification comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy, and facar, which means make. So it's really simple. Therefore, sanctification means to make holy. In the Greek, it's, the word used is hagios, and it's to be holy, and, and uh, that really means to be set apart as holy. Uh, you can think of something like the the things in the, in the tabernacle or the temple, uh, the different pieces that were in the temple that were set apart to, to be used as holy worship. You have been set apart. You've been washed and saved and made holy so that you can be uh, a, a person who worships God on this earth and used for God to serve God with all your heart. So me, you, and all believers, all of us, we had our, our former way of life, but now we have a new life. And what's interesting, in the same book of Corinthians, Paul calls this church that was struggling with some sin, and they needed to continue to be sanctified, continue to work out their holiness. They were already made holy. I'm going to explain the differences in a moment. But they also had some cleaning up to do, if you know what I mean. Okay? Okay. Uh, one example I thought about one time is, is when I got into some mulch and it got stuck in my clothes, over time I'm kind of taking all that mulch out of my pants and out of my clothing, my socks, and you're just kind of cleansing it over time and so you don't get splinters you know, as you're walking around. It's going to take some time. But what's interesting is, is Paul calls them for who they are in Christ and he calls them saints. He doesn't call them sinners. He calls them saints. Do you know what the word saint means? It means holy. It's the same word used in the Greek everywhere else when it comes to sanctification or holy. He's saying, you are holy. You are a saint. He's calling them for who they're supposed to be instead of the way they've been kind of struggling and living in. He's reminding them of who they are in Christ. You following me? Because they were getting into some things that were not good in their lives. So we're made holy, but we need to continue to work and grow in that holiness. We call that in Theology 101, positional and progressive sanctification. Positional and progressive. And you may be wondering, why does the Bible consistently challenge us to live a holy life if we're already made holy? Why did we read in 1 Peter today that we have to live holy because God is holy? If we're already holy, why do we have to live it? Well, while we are initially sanctified or made holy in God's sight through salvation, there is growing immaturity that needs to take place. Uh, like a newborn baby. When you're born again, you're a newborn baby, so to say. You're a babe in Christ, and so there's some growing up to do. If you're a new creation, you need to be taught and grow in how to live as that new creation in the scriptures as we read the words creation. Um, like, I'm a new creation in Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. In a sense, this is interesting. I had to really think, how would I explain this to you guys? In a sense, we progressively need to catch up to who we already are in Christ. We need to progressively catch up to who we already are in Christ. In other words, the Spirit is like sending a memo to your sinful nature, and the, and the sinful nature hasn't got the memo yet. Hey, you're saved. You're holy. Don't behave that way. Don't live that way. So you live your life focusing as well on honoring God with your life because of what he purchased for you on the cross to live a holy life. But theologian Millard Erickson 
does a little bit better job explaining this. I feel like I think this is a brilliant definition of the difference between positional, you know, immediate sanctification and then ongoing growth and sanctification. He says this, and it's on the screen for you. Progressive sanctification means the continued transformation of moral and spiritual character so that the life of the believer actually comes to mirror the standing which he or she already has in God's sight. Let me explain that for a moment. Keep it on the screen. God sees you as holy. It takes a little while for us to catch up that we're holy. And this, today, I'm praying that today you, you really grasp and understand who you are in Christ today. That God looks at you and he calls you a saint too. He calls you holy. He, says he wants you to also live who you are in his sight. That was made possible because Jesus washed away all your sin. And now you are identified and made holy. The Holy Spirit comes into you and the Holy Spirit is like saying to God, this person is holy. This person is forgiven. This person is sanctified, justified, no longer guilty of their sin. Now listen, this is a tough subject. This is, this is hard to understand. I cannot complete, completely teach you all about this topic. There are books and books and books on this. There are chapters in the Bible dedicated to this topic, like Romans chapter 7, right before what we're going to read today in Romans 8. And so it's... There's a lot to learn, and I just, I'm giving you what I can today. I want to encourage you to just keep digging into the Bible and good teachers. And, and so here's uh, one good teacher who teaches well on this, Jerry Bridges, in his book, Growing Your Faith. He says this, sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in us, whereby our inner being is progressively changed, freeing us more and more from sinful traits and developing within us over time, the virtues of Christ-like character. What I like about this one is, it's not just about what you don't do, it's who you're becoming to at the same time. Amen? God's not just saying, don't do all these things. You gotta replace those things with the fruit and character of Christ. Now, what example do we have for ongoing sanctification? I gave you this, the, that strong scripture that Paul taught in, in 1 Corinthians 6, but here's this, this one in 2 Corinthians 3.18. This is a great example of this progress in spiritual growth. He says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. They can see God and they can reflect him, in other words. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now, there's a lot of code word in there for this, okay? As you are, you've already been made holy through the Holy Spirit. As you are following Jesus and focusing on Christ, the Holy Spirit is making you more and more like him as you focus on him. Let me give you the ESV version. I'm going to read it. It's not on the screen. It says, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, focusing on the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, Jesus being that image from one degree to glory to another. You remember that song, from glory to glory? From one degree to glory to another. From one moment to of salvation to now growing, and then you have another great week of growing, and then you have a really good month of growing and becoming more like Jesus. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. It's the Spirit's responsibility in you to help you grow. That's good news, that he's in there to do that. Why does this matter? Why does this matter? Why is it important that we know the two differences? Well, first of all, just so you know, in Hebrews 12, 14, it says, no man shall see God without holiness. Without holiness, no one sees the Lord. So we need to be made holy, and that's what happens at salvation. And if Jesus were to come back right now, if Jesus were to come back right now, let's say you give your life to Christ, and Jesus were to come back immediately after that, you would go to heaven you would inherit the kingdom of God because you were made holy. But what do we do while we wait? 
What do we do while we wait for God to come back? Do we just get to live however we want? No, God's saying, live who you are in me. Live who I've made you to be. Live like Jesus. Live like Jesus. So that's important because here's why. Some people think they have to attain a certain amount of holiness for God to love and accept them. It's called legalism. Do these things and then you will be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches believe in what Christ did for you and you are saved. This is encouraging because some of us, we have to remember that we are already washed and made holy in God's sight. And so if you haven't attained a certain amount of holiness yet, you, don't, you feel like you, maybe you're, you're afraid that God's not going to take you with him. You know, Jesus isn't going to take you with him when he comes back. But that's not true. At salvation, you are already accepted and made holy. Some of us may be more mature by the time Christ comes back. Some of us may have cooperated more in the sanctification growing process when Jesus comes back. But either way, you are made holy. Doesn't that sound kind of funny what I'm saying? Like some of, some of us progressively matured sooner. That may be true. But it's not how, how much you've progressed. It's whether you've believed in Christ. It's your position. That's a clap. Yeah. Let's praise God for that. <laughs> praise the Lord. Because if you're, you're, you got to be careful with this teaching. This is why there's so many books on it. Because you can turn it into works. Works is what saves you instead of faith in Christ that saves you. Okay? That's why legalism is, is, is a concern here. And you want to be careful that you're not trying to earn your salvation or earn your holiness. No, you live out a holy life because you've been made holy. Uh, what's the goal, though, of sanctification? What, what's the goal of sanctification, well, we read it in that previous verse. Go back to, if, if you could, 2 Corinthians 3.18. The, the goal is that we are being changed into his glorious image, which is Jesus Christ. That's the goal, that we are being changed into him. But let's look at Romans 8.29. It says, I'm going to bounce in here, and I have this on the screen for you. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. Those who would believe in him, he wanted them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. He's referring to the same thing, Jesus well, I got to tell you something. That's helpful. I need a target. I need some direction. I need an example in front of me. I'm not the kind of guy that can put together a car model without the picture or instructions. Can you imagine trying to put a puzzle together without seeing the picture? If you can do that, God bless you. You must, you are on a different level. I put some puzzles together with my kids, and I was looking at that picture a lot. You look at the picture, and you start looking for the piece. That's the exact same thing we do with Jesus. We look at Jesus, and then we look at our lives, and we go, that is not of Jesus. Or we look at the, Jesus, and then we look at our lives, and we go, okay, uh, that, that was an act of what Jesus wants me to do. Praise the Lord. I did what Jesus would want me to do. Isn't that cool? You know who you're supposed to become. Because he gave us a target, an image, an example to focus on. And here's what's really important for you to understand. The Holy Spirit, that's his same target. The Spirit of the Lord is helping you grow from one degree to another to become like Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, he leads you into all truth. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. What's the Holy Spirit doing in your life? He's trying to lead you to grow and become and act and think and live like Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now you don't have to be lost. What do I do with my Christian life? What does it mean to be a Christian? It's Jesus. I don't get this puzzle. Where's the picture? Good news, Jesus. Because I couldn't do a puzzle without a picture either. 
It's so hard. I wouldn't be able to live this life without that picture. I wouldn't be able to live this life without the example of Christ. Now, that's already amazing. But here's what's amazing, too. The Holy Spirit comes into you to give you the power to do what pleases God. To become like Jesus, because you can't do it on your own power. Well, let me give you scripture to back that up. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. But before I say that, God doesn't expect you to be holy without his help. God doesn't expect you to be holy without his help. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live a holy life. God doesn't say, I want you to live holy, and he, just, he, he wants you to do it on your own power, your own energy. No, he gives you the Holy Spirit to live how he wants you to live, to live that sanctified, holy life. And this is what it says in Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Dear friends, you always followed my instructions. This is Paul pouring his heart out to the church in Philippi. He says, when I was with you, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Now, why would he say that? Because he was a living example in front of them of what Jesus would live like. You got to remember, the church of Philippi did not have Jesus walking around. They needed an example of what it looked like to follow Jesus in, in that time. And Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ in other places in Scripture. So he's saying, now that I'm away, just so you know, you need to follow the example that I laid out for you. And he says this. He says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Be involved. Make sure you're actually applying yourself to the grace of God. Don't take it for granted. Be active in living for God. He says this, work hard to show the results of your salvation. He's not saying work hard to get saved. That's not what he's saying. They're already saved. He's saying show the fruit of your salvation. Obeying God, how do we do that? Obeying God with deep reverence and fear. We obey God and we grow. And then he goes on to say this, for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Guess what those words there mean, the Holy Spirit? God has given his spirit to live in your life until the day he returns or until the day we die to help us be who we are called to be, and that is holy and like Jesus Christ. I can't be holy. You're right, but with God, with the Holy Spirit, you can. So let's go to Romans 8, and this is actually our primary text for today. So I'm going to have to preach really fast now. Romans 8 says in verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin, which also leads to death. He goes on to say, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Wow, that's good news. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Then he goes in to say what they used to be like. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. Your sinful nature never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Oh my goodness, you know how bad that is? We need to be saved then from our sinful nature. That's, that's salvation. How does he do it? The Holy Spirit. 
Verse nine, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit if you have the spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. That's why we need to be born again in the spirit. And Christ lives within you. So this is the Christian church and he's saying Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living in you. You have life because of the Holy Spirit. Physically too, the Holy Spirit is sustaining us. What he's talking about here really is in the end when our, our bodies will be resurrected and glorified. It's done because the power of the Holy Spirit will do it. He goes on to say this in verse 12, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. You don't have to do what your sinful nature wants to do. You don't have to. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Whoa. Or should I say, wow, that's what I like to say. That's a powerful scripture. This is, this is power for living free from sin. This is power for living a holy life. Jerry Bridges, in that same book I recommended, Growing Your Faith, he said this, Sin is like a defeated army in a civil war that instead of surrendering and laying down its arms, simply fades into the countryside from which it continues to wage a guerrilla war of harassment and sabotage against the government forces. Sin as a reigning power is defeated in the life of a believer. Sin has been defeated in our lives. He goes on to say this, but it will never surrender. Sin won't surrender. It will continue to harass us and seek to sabotage our Christian lives as long as we live. That tells me I need to stay humble and careful, but I need to know and I need to remember I have been made holy and I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me to not respond and do what my sinful nature wants me to do. That is a good thing that the Holy Spirit is in us. So how do, we, how do we, uh, we do this? Well, he's saying here that we gotta not follow our sinful nature, but follow the Holy Spirit. And I'm gonna go to Galatians 5, and we're gonna read 16 through 17 in verse 25. Now, Galatians 5, it's such a powerful scripture, and it talks about the sinful nature and the sinful things we do, like 1 Corinthians 6 did today. And then it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, which we're gonna get into later on here in this series. But he, he, this is what Paul says to this church. He says, so I say, Galatians 5, 16 through 17, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives or keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Now, can you imagine that you don't have the Holy Spirit in you? All you're doing is just doing whatever you want to do, whatever your sinful nature wants to do. So he goes on to say, these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you're not free to carry out your good intentions, or NIV says, to do whatever you want. Because who, you know, whatever we want sometimes is not really what God wants. It's our sinful desires. It's our sinful nature. So as a Christian, you have been declared holy in God's sight because the Holy Spirit has come in and washed you clean. But you have a responsibility to now be sanctified or live in sanctification and follow the Holy Spirit to help you live that holy life. We have a responsibility. We want to do it, though, because we're so grateful, really. Really? It's not an obligation, it's a desire because of what Christ did for us. And in last verse 25, he says, since we are living by the Spirit, 
Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In the Greek, you know what that means? <laughs> you ever play follow the leader in school back in the day? It means to line up behind the Holy Spirit. Line your life up behind him. If he wants you to do it, go and do it. If he doesn't want you to do that, don't do it. That's what it means to follow the Holy Spirit. I just thank God that the Holy Spirit is in here and here and just helping me so that I don't have to give in to my sinful nature. I just thank God for that, that we have power, that we've been set free from that. So here's two things we can do. Because what we're, what we're hearing is, as you can see from Galatians 5, Romans 8, and Philippians 2, that we're not passive bystanders, but we're active in the process of spiritual growth. That we're supposed to, now that we're saved, we're supposed to follow the Holy Spirit and be involved and intentional. And Jerry Bridges goes on to say in his book too, though sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit in us, it does involve our wholehearted response and obedience. He, referring to the Holy Spirit, works in us, but elicits our response to cooperate with him. We have to cooperate. We have to recognize what is of the sinful nature and what is of God. We have to follow the Spirit's leading as he leads us into all truth. When well, you ready for this? That means the second thing we need to do is we need to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Bible, Scripture. The Bible acts as a co-agent with the Holy Spirit in sanctification. In other words, as you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is also with you, helping you, showing you, and leading you as well as you read it. I, I promise you that's actually what happens. Have you ever read the Bible and were so encouraged by something, so convicted by something, or your eyes were open to something you've never seen before? We call that in theology illumination, the Holy Spirit illuminating, lighting it up, and helping you understand. That's what he does. He came into your life to help teach you. Because what would we, if, if you were all by yourself in a remote village somewhere and you had the Bible, there's no pastor or teacher, what happens? The Holy Spirit teaches you too. He helps. So the Bible is so important in following the Holy Spirit. I want to wrap up with this. And every pastor says that and then it's another 10 minutes, but I'm being serious. I'm serious. Fact check the pastor on that one, right? Sturkin. We choose to follow and obey the Spirit's leading in what scriptures are teaching us day by day. And I wrote this down. I just want to read it. God has given us the answer to the test or target for the goal in the Bible. The character of God is throughout the Bible, especially in the holy life of Christ. It's not a mystery what the Holy Spirit is working out in our hearts and minds. The Bible is like the blueprints for our new life construction. Jesus is the replica, the, the perfect image, the model that we belong, that we behold to become. Jesus is the model that we behold to become. In other words, fixing our eyes on. Behold him and you will become like him. Meanwhile, as we do those things, the Holy Spirit develops the character, the likeness, and the fruit of Jesus Christ in you. That's what he's doing. Because you can't, you yourself can't make yourself holy. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But what you do is you cooperate with the Holy Spirit by obeying its leading and what it teaches you to do. You grow from one degree of glory to another every time you obey the scripture and what the Holy Spirit says. What's the result? Philippians 1.6. Philippians 1.6, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The good work that God began in you will be completed. He finishes his task we are part of that process, though. We can't try to do life without the Holy Spirit. 
We're still here by the grace of God. We've been saved. We've been made holy. And he's asking us to live a holy life. Why does that matter? Because our, our fruit, the fruit of Christ in us, it glorifies God. And everyone around us will see Jesus through us. And they'll want Jesus too. Do you know that the end goal of all this wasn't just to be like Jesus, but it was to shine like Jesus in scriptures so that people would see God here on earth through the church? That's the goal of sanctification. That's why we live a holy life. I want my kids to see Jesus. I want my neighbors to see Jesus. My friends, my coworkers, my enemies. I want them to see Jesus and we must follow the spirit and live that holy life because if we do, the result will be they will see Jesus. God will complete that task. Let's pray. And then Dorothy's gonna come up and there's some really important things happening here at this church in the next couple months and we really need your help. We need a team together and make these events, make these moments happen because people need Jesus right now in our world. They always have, but man, don't they need it more than ever right now? Let's lock arms, let's team together and make these things happen. So hear, hear Dorothy out on what she's gonna share, what we're up to, and, and I pray that, <laughs> that we will be that light I'm talking about. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you as well for Jesus for that picture, for the puzzle of, of the Christian life, that we can look at Christ and then know who we're becoming. We can look at Christ and know that that's what the Holy Spirit is up to. We thank you, God, that you made us holy. And because we are holy, we will see you. We will have everlasting life. And God, I pray that if there's anyone in this room or online who has not believed in Jesus Christ, who has not been made clean and washed by the washing of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that they would cry out to you. They would look to you right now, God, that they would recognize their sin, recognize their need for Jesus and put their trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior from their sins. And I pray, God, that they would desire to live a life like Jesus and follow you all the days of their life. God, I pray that they would pray something or, or believe that and say it with their mouths and confess that Jesus is Lord in their life. Lord, and I pray that we as a church or any of their friends, when they tell them that they would come around them and help them and join in the process of this spiritual growth. God, save today. And thank you, God, that we know how we're supposed to grow now by following what your spirit is doing in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Love you, church. God bless you.